Hello everyone, my name is Esra and I would like to thank, you, thank everyone for joining us today as part of the Engage Conference. Um, this is such a wonderful space for everyone to be joining in with such inspiring leaders uh, who, will, who are coming today to share their stories and their experiences. So I'm really grateful to be joining in today. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, today's afternoon session. Um, her name is Grace of Dujani. Um, Grace, I'm personally looking forward to hearing about your experience and learning more about the work that you do and the, the, and the work that you're involved in as well. And I'm sure everyone is excited to hear about it as well. Uh, just to give a little bit of information about Grace Aldejani, uh, she is a certified event manager at White Oaks Conference Resort and Spa in Niagara on the Lake. Uh, Grace is a vice chair of the Women in Niagara Council, which is an advisory council to the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce with a focus on fostering growth and success of women in business in Niagara, known as WIN. WIN Council is dedicated to advocating on behalf of women in business in Niagara to ensure that we build back better uh, as a community with a strong focus on she recovery post pandemic. So thank you so much, Grace, for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to what you have to speak about today. So I'll uh, hand the floor to you. Thank you so much, Esra, and uh, thank you so much, everyone, uh, this afternoon, Next Niagara, for having me here to discuss this very important topic around the SheCovery project. My name is uh, Grace, and I'm co-chair of the WIND Council um, through the Greater Niagara Chamber of Commerce. Uh, as Ezra mentioned, we are an advisory council to the GNCC. Um, and just to kind of give you a quick idea of who we are and what we do, um, we represent the women in Niagara region who own, manage, and work as part of the 1,500 businesses that make up our Chamber of Commerce. Um, at when we strive to foster the growth and success of women in business and are comprised of a group of volunteers from a variety of sectors, um, including the finance sector, tourism and hospitality, the not-for-profit uh, sector, we have entrepreneurs, leadership coaches, um, and educators. And we meet regularly um, with the specific goal and objective to drive uh, and support professional growth for women in business in Niagara. Um, we provide education, mentorship programs, as well as host a number of events um, throughout the year. Um, as well, a big, big part of when um, we give our voices um, and support to advocate on behalf of initiatives, which are most important to women in our community. Um, and as we all know, the past 15 months have been an unprecedented time of change with the global COVID-19 pandemic. Um, research and data specifically collected um, all speak to the fact that women have been disproportionately affected as a result of the pandemic. Um, and it, a lot of the data and research specifically speaks to the significant um, economic impact it's had um, on our businesses and our business communities. Um, several economists have actually dubbed this a she session or a pink collar recession. Um, and we found that in March 2020, so right when the pandemic hit, um, women between the ages of 25 and 54, um, they lost twice as many jobs as men. Um, and we also saw that the Ontario Women's Labour Force participation rate fell to its lowest levels in 30 years. So this is a really significant time um, in women's workforce recovery. Um, and since uh, we've had some gradual reopenings, um, we actually have seen that there's been lower re-employment um, for women as opposed to men. Um, just taking a look at the end of the first uh, lockdown and pandemic when, um, you know, between May and, and August, um, we saw employment gains for men uh, over 200,000. Um, however, for women, that number was only uh, around 131,000. So it's, uh, it's a much, uh, there's a gap there still that we have to be aware of. Uh, we also know the pandemic enlarged existing inequalities for certain groups of women, uh, racialized women, indigenous women, single mothers, low income women, uh, immigrant women, 
women with disabilities and women, of course, in rural areas. And so there are several reasons um, which have contributed to this she session, as they're calling it. Um, so one of those reasons, of course, is the lockdowns and temporary business shutdowns and layoffs uh, during the state of emergency most severely affected occupations and sectors that predominantly employ women. Um, additionally, we saw that these sectors are also those in which women entrepreneurs uh, are typically more likely to operate. Um, and so their businesses tend to be newer and smaller and uh, less well financed. Um, another reason for this she session, uh, we see that there's been the restrictions on school and paid childcare facilities. So this has shifted a lot of additional hours of um, care and education onto parents. Um, and this has typically fallen to uh, mothers in most instances. And um, although we see that women are somewhat dominating the frontline responses of the COVID-19 pandemic um, in healthcare and these industries, um, they have not actually been included in terms of plans uh, for their recovery post-pandemic. So again, this is all very important information that we need to be aware of as we look at the she recovery. Um, and the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, um, so they recently released a report that uh, lays out a path to Ontario's she recovery by examining, um, they did this by specifically examining data on gendered labour market impacts of the pandemic. And so I'm going to speak a little bit to that she recovery report today, um, as it does provide a great, um, they provide cre key critical areas of focus um, as we all work together to build back better. Um, and so a lot of it is legislative policy driven, um, but if there are opportunities today that we can look in our own businesses um, of ways where we can start to implement some of these strategies, um, again, just to further drive that importance of the she recovery um, in our local region as well. And so um, it's important to mention this report looked at everything, everything through an intersectional lens to ensure that no woman is left behind. Um, and then as well, uh, it's also important to mention that um, this report comes from the fourth quarter of 2020. So um, although it doesn't speak to data relating to the newest uh, lockdowns that we've had, um, it speaks to the data surrounding information around the first lockdown, um, but it's still uh, initial reports out of the region and committee meetings and, and things that I've seen do still speak to the fact that women are exiting the workforce at an alarming rate um, as we continue through the lockdown. So this is all still very relevant and um, accurate uh, today. And so there was, uh, as mentioned, five key critical components that this she recovery report outlined. Um, activators or accelerators, as you would, things that we need to uh, put into place to drive this she recovery forward as quickly as possible. Um, and so one of those key areas was a focus on leadership and accountability. And, um, you know, we have to begin with a commitment from stakeholders to set collective targets around indicators of diversity and inclusion. Um, and it's not so much more, uh, it's not so much enough anymore to just do those commitments. We need to actually support uh, the development and further implementation of those strategies uh, to ensure we are advancing ourselves in diversity and inclusion in the workforce. Um, other ways we can do that, we can look at our procurement practices and are we incentivizing uh, diversity and inclusion? Um, you know, are we uh, introducing diversity components to procurement processes and um, looking for women and diverse entrepreneurs to participate in our supply chains? Um, so things really to keep in, in mind uh, on the leadership and accountability level. Additionally, uh, it'll be important to have women in the decision making bodies. So having women with the seat at the table, giving their information, their impact um, about what's currently happening and what's important to them. Um, and it would be, you know, another um, recommendation to even go as far as uh, establishing gender advisory committees, um, 
you know, in Niagara, we've seen that the Women's Advisory Council has been created through the region um, to do just that and provide a gender diverse, inclusive lens um, when they're looking at policies and strategies that are coming through um, our region. And uh, Wynne works with the Women's Advisory Committee as well. So um, it's really about a lot of collaboration there. Um, another key uh, critical point uh, or area of focus is workforce development. Um, this is, uh, I actually joined two, so I'm going to put uh, two of the components together, workforce development and flexibility. I feel they kind of go hand in hand and uh, for lack of time, I want to make sure we get through it all. But um, so workforce development, we need to start looking at initiatives that should focus on defining critical skills. Um, so looking at ways to accelerate women's reskilling in the sectors um, and also still ensuring that their other skills are utilized as well. Um, and then look at uh, ways that we can focus on increasing uh, women's participation in fields like skilled trade, technology, engineering roles. Um, these are typically male dominated industries, um, but they are fast growing industries. Um, and so it's important that we start to uh, attract uh, more women into those sectors as well. And flexible work as part of that. This has been a discussion that I'm sure many tables um, <clears throat> really an organization would have to assess the impacts of flexible work, um, of course, on productivity, on um, commuting, mental health, congestion, um, and other various areas of public concern. Um, but um, this is one way that it would definitely level the playing fields in terms of equality for women in the workforce. Um, and then how can we do this even on a larger scale? So are there things as tax incentives or toolkits and regulations in place? that um, employers can use to implement these flexible work arrangements in their organizations. Um, so again, just another critical factor in accelerating that recovery uh, project. Um, another area is entrepreneurship. Um, so women uh, entrepreneurs are coming into the market at um, you know, crazy rates, which is great. It's great to see that uh, production. And um, it needs to be understood that this is a pathway of economic growth as well. Um, and we need to look at a more inclusive ecosystem um, for women entrepreneurs. So really addressing um, additional barriers of entry, if there are that, uh, any um, as well. Uh, and that would be looking at it on an organizational level as well as a, an individual level. Um, and then additionally, you know, further support for those entrepreneur businesses, uh, female led businesses. Um, so whether that's assistance with additional grants, um, financing, legal advice, financial literacy, digital literacy, um, procurement, mentorship programs, childcare um, is talked about quite a bit. These are all um, additional factors that are emphasized as part of the importance um, of entrepreneurship in the she covery. Um, and finally, one of the last areas um, is child care. And uh, I put this at the end, not because it's the least important by any means. Um, it's actually one I can talk about forever. But um, this uh, is something that was outlined in the she recovery report by the OCC um, as critical as part of the she recovery project, um, that it would require both short and long term um, strategies and solutions. And as well, there was the recommendation to build a system wide reform to improve accessibility and affordability of childcare. And so this is a hot topic. I know a lot of people um, don't necessarily include childcare when we have discussions about, um, you know, economic drivers and what is an economic driver for a region. 
Um, and a lot of the language around childcare is typically that this is a women's issue or a social issue. Um, and I really want to emphasize that this is very much an economics issue. Um, we've recently seen reports um, out of the federal government, um, of course, in their budget, allocating the most money ever seen allocated to childcare um, with uh, the hopes that eventually it will be down to $10 per day. Um, and so when we talk about it as an economics issue, um, Deloitte recently published a study which compared the Quebec model of child care and its effects on the percentage of women returning to the workforce after having children. The study found that from 1997 to 2016, Quebec saw a 16 percentage point increase uh, of women's participation to the workforce. So it increased from 64 to 80%. Um, other provinces, Ontario being one of them, who had no uh, child care policy in place, only saw percentage points of four percentage point increases. Um, and why is this important? So this is really important because for every percentage point increase, um, that equates to over 1.8 Five billion dollars of contribution to the GDP. That's a significant contribution and that's just on a percentage point basis. So you can imagine if we get more women back into the workforce um, with uh, the process of, of implementing a comprehensive child care plan in place, I mean this is, um, it's almost like a no-brainer now. We, this is just something that needs to be in place. Um, we know that the return on investment in child care is actually five dollars for every dollar invested and that is money that will go right back into the economy. Um, we know there's a shortage of labor and uh, talent in the workforce and um, you know this is a ripple effect. This will only intensify with women continuing to leave the workforce um, if they do not have access to affordable quality childcare. Um, we also need to remember that um, when we have two household incomes, um, you know, we increase disposable income and we're going to need that disposable income as a driver to uh, the recovery of the other sectors like travel, tourism, retail and restaurants. Um, and so it's really important to remember that this is this is a report that outlines some great um, suggestions, recommendations. Um, but um, recognizing the problem is not simply enough anymore. Um, we need a collaborative response and that's going to be necessary from all levels of government, uh, businesses, post-secondary institutions, um, and other stakeholders to remove systemic barriers uh, to women's workforce participation. Um, and we need to start setting collective targets and building diversity into decision making structures, um, which will provide the right foundation for meaningful impact, allowing Niagara to build back better. Um, and so this is a conversation we could continue it um, for so long, and we'd like to continue this conversation. Um, so on June 15th, when we'll be hosting, um, it's a hackathon event. And so for anybody who doesn't know what a hackathon event is, um, a hackathon is where a group of people come together uh, in a short period of time to discuss issues and uh, tasks and come up with solutions. And so we're hoping to do just that. We would love, uh, you know, uh, anybody who's available to attend that day, we will have Claudia DeSanti. Um, she is the author and creator of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce Recovery Report. She is a senior policy an uh, analyst with the OCC. Um, so we'll be having a discussion with her to start uh, the day about her uh, report, the Shecovery report, and as well to get an idea of maybe where we stand now as we've uh, come through additional lockdowns. And um, as well, we'll get a sort of a snapshot or synopsis of what uh, is currently happening in our region. So we know uh, where we stand and, and where we have to progress to. And, uh, and then we're going to break off and we'd love to just have, um, you know, everybody collectively working on solutions and um, and bringing new things to the table to assist in our uh, she covery together. So thank you so much, everyone. 
I just want to thank you so much for your time and your effort and the work that you do in advocating for all the women and bringing uh, reports and evidence of, of the things that are happening within our community. Uh, I also do appreciate the fact that you did bring um, these issues forward so we can act as um, allies in making sure that the change does progress and the advocacy part continues to happen. So by bringing these issues forward, we're able to create that change, but we can do this only by advocating and talking about and creating these solutions. I know for sure that I will be signing up for the event uh, that you shared with everyone. I would love to uh, be part of such spaces as a woman, as a woman of color. There are different interse intersectionalities that do come into play as, as, as we navigate those spaces. So I do want to thank you. And it was a pleasure having you here. Really was great. So thank you. Thank you so much, Esra. And yes, anyway, we'd love to see you on the 15th um, as we collectively come together to, you know, really come up with some solutions to, to build back better. So thank you so much. Thank you.